This week's uh, portion of the week is Tetzave. And this all has relevance to the building of the Mishkan, providing the necessary materials, the vessels, to have a functioning Mishkan, which is the domicile for God's presence, which is the medium through which God dwells in our midst. As it said in last week's reading, you should make for me a sanctuary so that I should dwell in your midst. And this is only due because what happened because of the Chet Egel, the sin of the golden calf. We were disenfranchised. It's only due to Moshe's supplication where we reinstated. But because of what happened, now the relationship is arm's length. And therefore, God doesn't dwell directly in our midst, but rather it's through the medium known as the Mishkan. We know that one of the very important duties of the Kohen was to the kindling of the menorah. We know the whole story of Hanukkah. The Greeks had contaminated all the oil, and there was no oil to kindle the menorah. And they found one vial of oil which was only enough to burn one day and it burnt eight days. I mean, does it take that long to produce that amount of oil? We'll see in a moment. The only oil that qualifies for the menorah, it has to be pure on an absolute level. It's only the first droplet of oil that's extracted from the olive. The first droplet. Any droplet which is beyond the first doesn't qualify. So how many olives do you need as much as the saturated oil to have enough oil to fill seven receptacles that you burn from evening till morning? You need quite a bit of oil. To be able to extract that much oil, it's a lengthy price process. It was only after eight days that they have new oil ready, which was pure, not contaminated, to continue kindling the menorah. That's the story of Hanukkah. But olive oil is essential for the service of the menorah. Of course, you need that olive oil, which is the purest of pure. Okay? We had two temples. We had the first base of Migdosh, second base of Migdosh. The first base of Migdosh stood 410 years. After 410 years, it was destroyed by the Babylonians. There was a hiatus of 70 years. After 70 years, we came back, and we built the second temple. The second temple stood for 420 years. Numerically, in Hebrew, the letter Tuf is 400, Yud is 10. In Hebrew, Tuf is 400, and Chof, letter Chof is 20. So the first temple stood Tuf Yud, 410. The second temple stood 420. Okay? Now, after the first temple was destroyed, who built the first temple? King Solomon. Shlomo Melech. The second temple was built after we returned it was the Persian exile. That's the story of Purim. We returned to rebuild the second temple. Ezra Sofer, Ezra the scribe, brought the Jews from Babylon back to Israel. Israel at that time was in ruins. It was totally destroyed from the original conquest of the, of the Romans, of the Babylonians. Now, when the second temple was rebuilt, everything was not in place as it was in the first temple. Second temple, there was no ark. The ark that existed in the Holy of Holies in the first temple with the cherubs and all that was not in the second temple. Why? Because before it was destroyed, they hid it away. The Ur Vitumim, although the Breastplate with the stones, the colored stones, precious stones were there, but there was the name of Hashem 
which is named, known as the ultimate name, which allowed the, the stones to illuminate, was not in the second temple. There were a number of things that were not in the second temple. There were five things that were not there, which indicated that spiritually speaking, there was a spiritual deficiency. The Shekhinah, the divine presence, was not in the second temple as in the first temple. First temple was continuous at, a, at, the, at the most advanced level. Second temple, it was not a continuous basis, and it was not the most intense level as the first temple. So how many years was the Shechina at that special level, which was the equivalent of Sinai in the temple? 410 years. Okay? And last week's reading says, V'osu li migdosh, you should make for me a sanctuary, v'shochanti b'socho. What is the meaning of shachanti in Hebrew? And that I should dwell within it. I should dwell within it. Now, if you take the word v'shochanti, shochain means what? Either a neighbor or as a verb means a dweller. You dwell. V'shochan tof yud. I will dwell there for 410 years. So originally when God gave the order to build the Mishkan, and he's foretelling the temple, he says, I will dwell, my presence will be there, Shochein, tough you at 410 years. After 410 years, it's no longer going to be. The second temple, it's not that. It's there, but not at that level. Now, every morning we say, in Uvol that's right before the Olenu service, we cite a verse, we say, Ato, kod, ato Kadosh, Yoshev Tilos Yisrael, you are holy, the praise of the Jewish people. We say to God, Ato Kadosh, you are Kadosh, Yoshev Tilos Yisrael, the one who dwells among the Jewish people. What do you think the numerical value of Kadosh is? Numerical value of Kadosh is 410. 410. Ato Kadosh is shaped to How many years is God going to dwell in our midst at that special level? The numerical value of Kadosh. The Kadosh will be Yoshev Tilos Yisrael. Second temple was not. So therefore, this alludes back to Veshachanti. Shochein Tof Yud. God will dwell in our midst for 410 years. What I'm telling you now is the Balaturim. This is the Balaturim points this out. Now, what exactly was the significance and the value of the menorah? Each of the vessels had an innate value. So the Gemara tells us in one location that in life, we want to merit certain advantages, certain endowments, which don't come naturally. You have to, you have to merit them. Wisdom is, is not a simple thing. People may, may have great IQs, but wisdom, they don't have wisdom. No. You score, they score exceptionally on that IQ test, but the man himself is a fool. No. He doesn't see the forest from the trees. Wealth. We have to do certain things to engender wealth, to merit wealth, not to create wealth, to merit wealth. Now, in the covered sanctuary of the temple, where was the menorah located? It was located on the southern wall of the covered sanctuary. Where was the golden table, which had the showbread? There were two stacks of showbread, one, each one six. And everything about that table was gold. What is a golden table? Which has freshly baked bread displayed on it. That's called the table of royalty. The table of king is, is gold. So the, the golden table, which is on the northern wall, that represents Malchus. That's kingship. Kingship and wealth are synonymous. They go hand in hand. On the southern wall, which is the Nora, elu elucidation, illumination. What, what does it illuminate? The covered sanctuary was a closed area. Nobody even went there. It represents the elucidation of the written law. All the divine assistance that we achieve or merit is in the merit of the kindling of that menorah.
Just as that candelabra with the olive oil, it gives forth light, which is gives clarity, understanding, illumination, identically to be able to delve into the written law to come upon its truths, which is the oral law, you need special divine assistance. Otherwise, it doesn't come about. It has nothing to do with the level of brilliance. We're talking about coming upon truth. Now, the human faculty, regardless of what how great it is and how advanced it may be, or the capacity-wise, it's still a, it's a physical faculty. It's part of physical, the physicality of the person. Every all the information of the Torah, although its application is in the material, tefillin, understanding the laws of contracts, Jewish marriage, Jewish divorce, and you have to meet certain criteria, or the laws of sacrifices, how it's slaughtered, how you burn it, the mishkan. It's a physical edifice. But although it was a physical edifice, but its significance was spiritual. It's all that these are only symbolisms. They're representations of something which exists in the spiritual realm. And God prescribed them and they had to be made to specification. Otherwise, they wouldn't generate those spiritual forces which they're meant to generate. It's filling, you may wear that leather box. But if it doesn't conform to the laws of how tefillin have to be made and what's contained within those leather boxes and sewn in a certain way, closed with a certain type of gut, it means nothing. It has no effect whatsoever. You have to meet God's criteria to activate those forces. Why? Because these, the forms and the profiles of every mitzvah is created by God because only if you follow and participate in it as God prescribes, then it activates those forces. The mind is physical. How does a physical mind, which has great limitation, regardless of how brilliant you may be, how does that somehow process, process spiritual information? Retention-wise and understanding-wise. You need special divine assistance. That, to come upon its truth, there's no question. You need divine assistance. But even to understand it on an elementary level, you need divine assistance because the information you're processing is not physical information, it's spiritual information. And that's what the, not the human faculty is, the brain. The brain is for, for, for the physical, not for the spiritual. Therefore, you need God's intervention to allow you to understand with the physical faculty something which is outside the realm of the physical. That's the understanding. So the Talmud tells us, if you want to become wise, Misa wrote lahachim yadrim. If you want to become wise, when you say that, it should be in a southeast direction. We pray to the east, but it's slightly to the southern. Then you merit wisdom. Why? Because the menorah was on the southern wall of the covered sanctuary. And if you want to become wealthy, yatspin. You should say damida in a northeast direction. Because since the golden table, which is the table of royalty, represents wealth, that's how you engender wealth. That's what it's about. But what is the menorah? Menorah is wisdom. That's elucidation. Elucidating what? The elucidation of the Torah itself. Okay. This elucidation, the fuel has to be olive oil. Any other oil doesn't qualify. Which olive oil? It has to be zach. It has to be pure. And it has to be pressed specifically lemaor for kindling which is only the first droplet. That's its level of purity. So the question is, it says in the verse, you should, you should take from the Jewish people for yourself this pure olive oil. What do you for yourself? What does Moshe have to do with olive oil? Now, if we're saying that 
all the divine assistance to understand the Torah is activated and generated by the kindling of the Torah, which represents elucidation. So who's the one who has the greatest relevance to Torah? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe was, was, was the conduit for which God transmitted the Torah to the Jewish people. He had that capacity. He himself, take that oil for yourself, meaning that's, that's your area of responsibility. To generate and give the worthiness of the Jewish people should be able to come upon God's truths, which is through the Torah itself. But for that, you need special assistance. You need divine assistance. Therefore, it's yichu lecho. Take for yourself. Shem and zoch. It's pure because it's pressed lemor for illumination. There's a Zohar, which the Orachim HaKodesh cites. That we experienced four exiles. We're still experiencing the fifth. The first exile was the Babylonian exile. The second exile, which was towards the end of the seven years, was Parasumadai, Persia and the Medes. The third exile were the Greeks. That's Hanukkah. The last exile, which is the lengthiest exile, that's called the Ed Edomite exile, the Edomites. The Romans came 180 years before the temple was destroyed, and they actually took over Israel. And they were the dominant power. Now, for any level of transition from one level to another level, you need merit. Why were we redeemed from the Babylonian exile? So the Midrash says, quotes a verse, it was the merit of Avram Avinu. That's why we were redeemed from the Babylonian exile. Why were we redeemed from the second exile, which is the Persians and the Medes? That's the merit of Yitzhak. And why were we redeemed from the exile of the, the exile of the Greeks? in the merit of Yaakov. And who's going to redeem us from the exile of the, of the Edomites, which are the Romans? The last exile is the lengthiest exile. We're still waiting. It's over 2,000 years since the destruction of the temple. And we're still not out of this. Why? So the Zohar says, was the only way we could be extracted from this exile is only in the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe will not allow his merit to be used unless we meet certain levels of criteria in Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu is the is, is the, the, the embodiment of the Torah's entirety. So until we sufficiently are involved and we make the necessary sacrifices for the sake of Torah, only then will Moshe allow his merit to be used to bring about the ultimate redemption. That's why it's been such a lengthy process. The blessing Yitzchok gave to Yaakov. What did he say? Akol kol Yaakov yedai b'day Yisuf. The voice is the verse of Jacob, and the hands are the hands of Esav. Kol kol Yaakov yedai b'day Yisuf. That's what he said. So the Midrash tells us that if the voice is the voice of Jacob, meaning you go to the study halls, and yet people studying Torah. You go to the shuls, and you hear teachers teaching young children their, their Torah studies. That's Kol Yaakov. Without vulnerable to the Edomites. So what causes us to be under the heel of the Edomites? Where we fall short of what Torah should be. But if we're fully engaged, Edom immediately is incapacitated. Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't allow his merit to be to supplement where we have fallen short of where we should be. The Torah has to be Shem and Zay Zoch. It has to be with a purity you have to study Torah. Personal studies Torah with an ultimatum, with an ultimatum. It's, already, it's murky. 
It's not pure. It's not clear. But a person who studies Torah selflessly for the sake of God, that's the true Kol Yaakov. That's the purest of the voices. And if you have that, the Yidamina Yideisav. Yideisav's hands are, cannot be, he's totally incapacitated. He cannot dominate us. Therefore, it's take for yourself. Since Moshe Rabbeinu is the, is the center of everything, he represents the Torah as long as he was alive. So if that's the case, take for yourself all these things, this oil for Moshe Rabbeinu. Because Moshe Rabbeinu is the embodiment of Torah. What would have been the most logical place to put the menorah? Where was the Oron, the Ark, located? The Ark contained the second set of tablets, the first set which were broken, and the Sefer Torah. So that's all the representation of the written law. It had a golden cover with the cherubs on that cover. So if the menorah itself represents the elucidation of the Torah, of the written law, what should what would be the most logical location to put that menorah? Alongside the ark? Meaning, this is the elucidation of that. But Hashem says, It should be set up on the other side of the curtain with the light slightly toned down. Now, what's the reason why it's on the other side of the curtain? So the Midrash tells us, Hashem says, and I've said this in the past, God says, the holy of holies is the location of the Shekhinah. We may delude ourselves, you know, see, God needs our light. God can only get going if we provide the light, if you know, we don't provide the light, God can't get, can't get going. You know, it's like a person has a, a pacemaker which is activated by, by, the, by the sun. Solar energy activates it. God forbid if someone would be shining, you know, something, he's going he's gonna to fall short of, of wherever he should be. So what elucidates the Torah? All the siyat the divine assistance to understand the Torah comes from the illumination of the, of the, the kindling of the menorah. It should be alongside the Oro. God says, no, on the other side. Don't think I need your light. Okay? That's one part of the Midrash. Moshe is given the order, create a menorah for the sake of illumination. Moshe says to God, do you need our light? You're, you're the light of the world. What do you need our light? So he says to Moshe, the reason why I'm asking you to kindle lights for me is because to show the nations of the world that I do need your light. That's why I want you to kindle light, to fill the cups with oil and you should be kindled light. Because I do need your light. I do need your light. I mean, we have two contradictory statements. Here you tell me to keep the menorah outside of the holy, the inner innards, the holy of holies, because you shouldn't think I need your light. So we ask God, so if you don't need our light, why are you asking them to kindle the menorah? He says, to elevate you in the eyes of the world, that they should see your light makes a difference. That means I need your light. What's the difference? The answer is God needs nothing. We discussed it in the Ramchal. Why did God create the world in existence? Because God being good on an absolute level, good does good. As a result of that, he created mankind. That we should be the beneficiaries of our actions. Okay?
So God creates systems. You do this, it activates that. Activates certain energies. So God created the systems. Now the question is, is God locked into those systems? If I, if I build a vault and it has a combination on it, and I take the safe maker and put him in the vault and lock the vault, could the safe maker come out of the vault? Well, he said, well, if he created it, he should be able to get out of it. No. If there's no release on that lock from the inside, he's not getting out of the vault. And he will die in that vault. All the systems that God put into place, why are they operating? Is it the systems outside of God? Or the systems are because God wills those systems should operate as they operate. The simple understanding is the systems are in place to operate because God wills they should operate in a certain way. Otherwise, God wills they should cease to operate. Like what happened in Egypt, the deities. He sees they should stop operating. What about... Let's say we're unworthy. If we're unworthy, if we're very worthy, we read the Torah, God says, the bounty will be without, without limit. If you're not worthy, God forbid, God will bring curses and destruction upon the Jewish people. That's the reality of Jewish history. So what does that mean? What determines whether we rise or we fall? It depends how much light we're generating. You generate more light, you're more worthy. You generate light, which is basically at, almost at a nil level, then you get nothing. So that's the understanding now. God gave us his Torah. God says, I don't want that menorah alongside the Oron, the Ark and the Holy of Holies. Because you may think that your behavior determines exactly how I have to behave, how I have to interact. God says, I don't need your light. Although your behavior determines whether existence rises or falls, but if I should decide differently, then it doesn't fall. If I say it should rise. That's Torah. I don't need your light. So if that's the case, why are you asking us to kindle the menorah? The answer is to elevate you in the eyes of the nations of the world, because they should understand under no normal circumstances, stances, there is a system. The world functions within that system. If the Jews do well, the world rises. If they fail, the world falls. Regarding any other nation, their personal behavior only affects them. It has nothing to do with any other nation. Or on a global level, has no effect on existence. The Jew, because of who the Jew is, your success, everybody is a beneficiary of that success. All mankind. But if you choose to fail, then you, you're unworthy. But I'm not bound by that. Because if I should choose to will blessing and chesed, even though you're unworthy, it happens. Well, what about the system? As the Ramchal says, God is the, is the basis for the system. The system only exists because God wills the system should be as that. But if you should will the system should be different, it's a different system. So you never lock, God's never locked into anything. Because whatever he's associated with, that exists only because he willed that should exist. It says it should be pressed kosis labor. Numerically, what is kosis? 420, 410. Meaning we'll be kindling that menorah for 400, first 410 years of the temple and the second temple, 420 years. That's kosis. For how many years will the menorah be illuminated and kindled the miracle value of kosis? Okay, I think we're going to stop here. I'll end it.